my brothers and I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has seen fit to call you to this holy place, that you might uh, experience worshiping in spirit and in truth. I'd like to introduce the minister of the hour, Brother Steve Ruoff. He's an elder in the church. He comes to us from the uh, South Chrysler congregation. We're thankful to have him and his wife with us this day. And I ask uh, for your kind and prayerful attention that those words which he desires to share with you and which your Lord desires to share with you might enter into your hearts this day. I'd like to share with you out of the uh, book of Acts. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they sent for Barnabas, and he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. God, the Eternal Father, we come before Thee with joy in our hearts. So thankful, dear Lord, for the opportunity and the privilege to come and to worship and to praise Thy holy name through song and through prayer and to hear the preached word of the testimony of Thy Son. And so, Heavenly Father, as your people have gathered and have felt the movement of the Spirit to bring them to this place this morning, we would pray that you would go before us, that this service may be consecrated unto thee, and that thy will might be done, that the words that our brother brings would be from on high, and that we would have that testimony and that assurance that thou art the God of our fathers even of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, that our hearts may be turned, Heavenly Father, to the fathers, and that we might know and experience those things for this congregation that you would have for us that is expedient this day. May our hearts be prepared, may we be in tune, and may thy name be glorified this day. We pray in the name of your Son, even the only begotten, who is the Lord Jesus. Even so, amen.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the blessings that Thou hast poured out upon us as a people, both those blessings which have been temporal and those which have been in the realm of the spiritual world. Who Thou who hast called us out of darkness into light, we desire to serve Thee and uh, we make this offering unto Thee. But pray, Heavenly Father, that Thou would accept not only the offering of our temporal funds, but Thou would accept also the offering of the heart, Heavenly Father. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you this morning from the first epistle of Peter, the first chapter, and also from Isaiah, the 45th chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with unspeakable joy and full of glory, receiving the object of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else.
As I uh, sat in the class this morning, the Lord, uh, I believe, put into my mind the thought that uh, he was pleased with the preparation of this branch and the, the desire of each of you to bear witness of the Lord Jesus and that the day will come this branch will be filled to overflowing with those who are seeking truth and crying out for deliverance. And this is part of your preparation for that hour. My um, first experience with faith began at a very young age. I was probably five or six years old. And I believe that I wasn't feeling well and my mother put me to bed to rest, and to recover. And as she did that, I uh, fell asleep and, and had a dream. And in my dream, my mother was putting me to bed. But that uh, she also uh, allowed uh, a man to be uh, chained in my room. And I was given to know that this, uh, this man represented darkness and evil. And I didn't understand why I was left in that presence. But shortly after uh, falling asleep in this dream, the, uh, the power of darkness, that man broke free from his chain and jumped on me and began to suffocate me. I could not speak. It was no longer a dream at this point. This, it was real. And at six years old, I knew to cry out in my mind to God for deliverance. And as I did, I was released from that power of darkness, having my first experience with the power of faith, the knowledge that there was a power greater than the powers of darkness. In our church, we have uh, patriarchal ministry, the order of evangelists, patriarchs that one of their responsibilities is to take from the rich storehouse of blessings that the Lord has for each who covenant with him. And the patriarch bestows a blessing, providing counsel from heaven and direction for one's life. What a marvelous blessing that is to the Lord's people and to his church. And in my patriarchal blessing are found these words. Very importantly, he has given you the gift of faith. He gave you this gift in rich measure. You have exercised this gift and you are admonished to continue to develop it. For it is the very foundation of your life and ministry for your God. 
Reach out to him always in simple faith. Trust him to have his way in your life. It was in simple faith as a five or six year old boy that I reached out in faith to he who is mighty to save. And I have had to reach out to him all the days of my life. Expressing that faith and having that faith tried and blessed as a result. And so I'm uh, thankful to be able to uh, stand before you and bear witness of the Lord Jesus this morning. To bear witness of uh, what it is to be a faithful people. To have the gift of faith. I found it interesting when Leonard called me and asked me to share with you this morning. He emphasized the, the faith toward God and not the faith, faith in God. And I think one of the great faith experiences in the, in the Holy Scriptures is the time when Jesus was uh, suffering. He was grieving for the loss of his cousin John, the Baptist who had been beheaded. And he had drawn apart and tried to find some solace or comfort from heaven. And there were many who followed after him into the desert. And of course, you know the story of the 5,000 who were fed from a meager five loaves and two fishes. It was actually 5,000 plus mothers and their children. And after that experience, the Lord sent his disciples onto a ship that he might be alone and go up into the mountain to continue his petitions to his heavenly father. But the sea became very rough and the Lord knew he needed to be with those who were fearful. And so he came and began to walk out on the water towards the ship and the disciples saw the Lord Jesus and they became fearful for they thought it was a spirit. And the Lord told them not to fear that it was he their Lord. And Peter said, if it really is you, Lord, bid me come. And the Lord said, Peter, come. And so Peter, who believed in Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, stepped out of the boat and onto the water and began to walk. Experiencing the power of faith for a moment. And then Peter, because of the boisterous waves, lost his, his faith. He began to doubt. He began to sink in the water and he cried out to the Lord Jesus that he might save him. And Jesus immediately stretched forth his hand and rescued Peter. Getting out of the boat was an expression of faith, but not faith alone. Peter could have expressed faith in the Lord Jesus simply by remaining in the boat and saying, I believe in you. But he expressed through his actions the power of faith. But getting out of the boat did not save Peter. In fact, he cried out unto the Lord to save him. His faith did allow him to move toward the Son of God, but did not bring him into his presence. Belief alone would have left Peter in the boat. One of Satan's greatest tools is to cause men to believe that they don't need to leave the boat. 
that simply to believe in him is sufficient. There's a beautiful book written called Lectures of Faith, and I want to share some things from that this morning. In that book, faith is described as the first principle of revealed religion and the foundation of all righteousness. It is the foundation, but it is not the end. It is the beginning. It is the the power of this gospel. It is the power by which all things were created and made. But if we leave ourselves at faith alone, we will not have found our way. Secondly, faith is the assurance which men have of the existence of things they have not seen and the principle of action in all intelligent beings. It is only faith that is the moving cause of all action in us, both temporal and spiritual. It's by faith that we move. Were it not for faith, we would shrivel up and die. There would be no existence. The question is asked, would you have ever sown if you knew that you were not going to reap? And the answer is no, we would not. This is just a reflection of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, which says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Did you ever wonder about Adam and whether or not Adam had faith in the beginning? His was knowledge, wasn't it? He walked and talked with God until he was cast out of the garden because of sin. And so... Adam didn't have to have faith in the existence of God. But once cast out of the garden, Adam's faith was expressed in his hope that the promises that God was making to him and to all men were true. His hope and his faith was in the promises of eternal life to those who were obedient. It was through the testimony of Adam then that his posterity was made aware that God existed and thus he became the object of their faith and that that motivated them to search, to feel after a knowledge of his character, of his perfection and his attributes, that they might not only commune with him and behold his glory, but to be partakers of his power and one day again stand in his presence. You know, it's interesting. Scripture tells us that the spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil, that he may choose with perfect knowledge light over darkness. And so given that choice, what is it in the revealed character of God that allows men to choose him, that allows men to be willing to place their faith in him? And I want to share with you six things that make God worthy of our faith. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He was God before the world was created and the same God that he was after it was created. There is no beginning or end with him. And though that's beyond our comprehension, it's something that that brings comfort to me somehow in knowing I worship a God and that there is no greater God, that he is the only true and living God. He is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in goodness. 
such necessary attributes if he's going to pursue fallen man. Aren't you glad that he is a merciful, loving God filled with goodness and righteousness and that he's slow to anger? Number three, he changes not, neither is there variableness in him. His course is one eternal round. Can you imagine for a moment the chaos if God were a changeable God? In Isaiah 29, we find these words, For behold, I am God, and I am a God of miracles. And I will show unto the world that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I work not among the children of men, save it be according to their faith. If we find for a moment that God is absent from our lives, not working in our midst, then we need to examine our faith. In Malachi, the third chapter, we find these words, very simple, I am the Lord, I change not. If he was a God of miracles in the beginning, he is still a God of miracles today. If angelic ministry was part of heaven's dealings with men in days gone by, so shall it be in our day. If God revealed himself to men in Adam's day, in the days of the ancient prophets, so will he in our day. If God had a holy priesthood consisting of apostles and prophets and seventies and elders and other divinely appointed offices in ancient times, so will he in our day. He is a God of truth and he cannot lie. Truth is not relative to God, but rather truth is independent in that sphere in which he placed it to act for itself and all intelligence also. Do you see the beauty of that? And he says that if it were not so, there would be no existence. I can't imagine worshiping a God I couldn't trust. I've been around chronic habitual liars. And that is distrust in its highest form. And were God a God of change, he would be a liar. And he's not a liar. He's a God of truth and righteousness and justice. Number five, he is no respecter of persons. There's no favoritism or partiality with God. It's so comforting to know especially in that uh, in our human condition, we are respecters of persons. It's nice to know that God loves us the same. And finally, he's a God of love. He is love. And I would ask you this morning, would we pursue a God who is a God of hate? What a miserable existence that would be. So it is then because of his divine attributes. We are drawn to him and that we naturally express our faith in him whom we have not seen. Because he is worthy of our belief. Listen to these words of scripture. Behold, I say unto you that she shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal and this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope for without faith there cannot be any hope. I can't imagine those who go through this life without hope. That there is something beyond the veil. That this is not the end of our existence. It is that hope which casteth out fear and doubt. The ultimate purpose in humanity's faith in God 
is that they might lay hold upon eternal life. Is it not so? Therefore, we must be reconciled to Christ. The divinely appointed and only eternally significant and meaningful purpose of this earthly journey is that we might be reconciled to Christ. And it's only by our faith and coming to a knowledge of and responding to the fullness of those truths which he proclaimed as necessary for salvation that such is even possible. Faith, when exercised as it moved Peter toward God, moves us toward God. Our faith must take us somewhere. There's no such thing as static faith. True faith compels us toward God with great desire to find ourselves within, com within compliance. of his will. The scriptures uh, share great insight as to the, the meaning of faith and to its importance. And there are 10 things that I want to briefly share with you about faith and its significance and how it's demonstrated. Each of these things that I'm going to share with you is supported by scripture. We must have faith to please him. It is impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, we deny the existence of God. Can we not agree on that? Without faith, we deny the existence of God. Faith is necessary to be righteous and just. Faith is the first step of our obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if faith doesn't bring us to repentance, which Carl's going to talk about next week in baptism, then our faith has not been sufficient. It is required that we might be forgiven. Makes sense, doesn't it? We have to believe in he whom we seek forgiveness from. Number four, it's fundamental to our capacity to access grace. I'm going to let you percolate on that one a little bit. Grace is extended to all, but accessible only to them that believe and try to keep his commandments. Faith is necessary to obtain salvation. Without faith, there is no hope. It is the power by which all things are accomplished. The principle of power is resident in the bosom of God by which the worlds were framed. All things then exist by reason of faith. Makes sense. All things were cr created by faith. Or if it was the power by which all things were created, then surely it is that by which all is sustained. And Jesus said unto them, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. We have not understood the power of faith. We have not understood the power of faith. By faith, 
miracles are wrought. The angels appear and minister unto men. In this church of Jesus Christ, the Melchizedek priesthood has the authority to lay on hands, which will also be a part of this series. And one of the ordinances under the laying on of hands is for the healing of the sick, as, as found in James, the fifth chapter, where he writes, Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. He'll anoint with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. It's an ordinance of faith. I can remember one time a few years ago being called to a hospital. I was told that there was a young mother there of two, two daughters, two young daughters, whose health had deteriorated rapidly. She was in a, a drug-induced coma, and she was in multiple organ failure because of a hole in her heart. And we were there because uh, there really wasn't any hope. She was too weak to be operated on to try to save her. The doctors were fe fearful if they tried that she would die. And so we went and we anointed her head with oil and administered under her that ordinance of healing. And when we were finished, I took Dawn's hand in mine and she couldn't hear me but her mother was standing at the foot of the bed and I said Dawn it's going to be okay and I kicked myself for doing that because typically you wouldn't give hope to someone if you weren't sure but I felt led to uh, communicate that to Dawn to hang in there we left and I received a call the next day that as we walked out of the, the uh, intensive care room where she was being treated and held, the nurse said she began to rally. From that moment, the doctor came by and he said, this is the window that we've been looking for. And Dawn went into surgery the next day, that day the following day from when we were there. And in over 30 hours of surgery, they patched her heart 10 times. And each time they would patch it and put it back in, the patch would break. I don't know too many doctors that would try for 30 some hours. But the Lord was on her side through that ordinance of administration and through the exercise of faith And on the 10th try, the patch held. And Dawn lives because of the power of God. Because miracles are wrought in this day as they were in ancient times because of faith. The shield of faith is necessary to quench the fiery darts of the adversary. Don't we know that that's true? True faith motivates us to seek a fullness of truth. And finally, it is by faith that we have hope in a life beyond this one. We are called to center our faith in him for life and for salvation. The opening scripture I read from 1 Peter made reference to the trial of our faith, being tried, as it were, by fire. One of the, uh, the most beautiful and most powerful experiences in scripture is one that's familiar to us and came immediately to mind as I considered 
this part of faith. It's the testimony of Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Hebrew names for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three young men were faithful. They refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's gods. And he brought them before him and he gave them a second chance and told them if they would bow down, that they would be spared, but otherwise they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. It was heated seven times its normal heat. And the beauty of their faith is expressed in their response to the king. When they answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. We are not careful. We don't have to think about it. If it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And they were immediately thrown into the fire. And these three men fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace if you remember, was heated to such a temperature that those who threw in these men were, were killed just in throwing them into the fire, getting close to the furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound to the, into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the kind, Unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What a marvelous faith. And this is the result of their faith. And the reason that I know someday this building will be full. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Saints, I believe that our faith in God requires something of us. That is the sacrificial offering of our lives. In James, the second chapter, we find these words. Yea, a man may say, I will show thee I have faith without works. But I say, show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. As did those three Hebrew young men. For if a brother or sister be naked and destitute, and one of you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding he give not those things which are needful to the body. What profit is your faith unto such? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Therefore, wilt thou, O vain man, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead and cannot save you? We have to do more than believe. We must get out of the boat. Listen to these beautiful words that come from the lectures of faith concerning sacrifice. They're some of the most powerful words that were ever written. Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to
to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things, not even withholding his life, that men do know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. Do you see the tie between sacrifice and faith? We cannot obtain the faith necessary to inherit eternal life without the sacrifice of all earthly things, which is the laying down of our lives, which is the taking up of our cross and following him. I'll never forget the testimony of Charles Derry, one of the uh, ministers of the missionaries of the Latter-day Gospel, who understood something of sacrifice. If you haven't read his book, his autobiography, I would highly recommend that you do so. It will increase your faith. But he uh, writes in his journal of more than one occasion, but on this particular occasion where he was, he had made a commitment to preach in a neighboring town, which was more than 20 miles away, I think it was like 24 miles away. And there was a raging blizzard in the middle of winter with sub-zero temperatures and, and uh, blizzardy, icy, cold conditions. I wouldn't travel that distance in my car. He rode on horseback the entire way. People begged him not to go, but he said it would be all right. He had faith that God would see him through the storm. And he did. The storm was so bad when he arrived that no one came. But he was not discouraged. He knew he had fulfilled his commitment. And what a great expression of faith that is for us. He rode that distance on that day that our faith might be increased. Jesus Christ said that he would build its church that he would build his church. He spoke those words to Peter. That thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Christ did establish his church because he's a man of his word. One church, the church of Jesus Christ, We must ask ourselves, and what happened to that which was perfectly built? Did it fracture into a thousand different denominations with different doctrines and messages, all claiming to be Christ's church? It doesn't make much sense, does it? We do not worship a God of confusion or change. So what happened to Christ's church? Listen to these words concerning the falling away or the apostasy. What men did to that which he built. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. And from Amos the prophet, Behold the days come, saith the the Lord God, 
that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And this is what happened to the church according to John the Revelator in Revelations, the 12th chapter. And the woman, which is the church of God, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore years. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. So we know that the church was hidden up. To come back in 1,260 years. That that was the length of time, according to what we just read, that the church would be hidden up in the wilderness. The Lombard invasion of Rome and, and the final destruction of the Roman Empire the rise of papal or the supremacy of the pope occurred around 570 AD and was the high point of the apostasy, according to biblical scholars, not the writers of our church. If so, 1260 years later, the length of time that Christ church was to be in the wilderness, or around 1830, something significant should have happened regarding the restoration of his true church to the earth. That takes us to 1820. There was a great period of revival, religious revival. The Protestant churches were on the move, trying to gain converts. There was great excitement in upstate New York where a little boy, a young boy at the age of 14 lived. It was also a time of great confusion and this young boy, Joseph, wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to join the right church, but he was confused. He was a young man of faith. And he came across a scripture in James, the first chapter, the fifth verse, that if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. He believed the promise of God. He expressed and exercised his faith. And so he took that scripture and put it to the test and went to a grove of trees and knelt down and poured out his heart unto God, asking God to honor his promise and to tell him which church it was that he was to join. And I want to read you just a, a portion of that experience. My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. And no sooner did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak. Let me back up just a little bit here. I want to give you. A... As he knelt down to pray, he was overcome by a, a power of darkness that was was amazing according to him and it threatened his destruction. But at the very last moment when he thought he was about to be destroyed, this pillar of light descended upon his prayer scene where he was knelt down in this grove. And he says, just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name and said, pointing to the other, this is my beloved son, hear him. Very similar to what John heard as Jesus came up out of the water. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. My object in going to inquire the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right that I might know which to join. No sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself so as to be able to speak than I asked the personage who stood above me in the light, 
which of all the sects was right. I was answered that I must join none of them. And he said they draw near, this person, he said they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for doctrine the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power, power thereof. He again forbade, forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things he, did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. Three years later, after terrible persecution, when he began to share his testimony of this experience, he was persecuted beyond our ability to comprehend as a young boy. Three years later, an angel appeared to him and told him that he had a great work to do for the Lord. And he told him that there were deposited upon plates in a stone box hidden in a hill, writings from those who had slumbered, which contained the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't have time to share with you that portion of the vision, but it was also beautiful. And so Joseph, his work was begun. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the timing of it, but I would just bear testimony to you that the Holy Scriptures talk of this book that would come forth from those who had slumbered. And that it, and it speaks specifically of the timing of it, that Lebanon would again be a fruitful field. The rains, the, the, the early rains had been dried up by the Lord as a curse. And the Lord says, said in, in prophecy, that this book would come forth just before those latter rains were restored in 1853 the rains began to fall in Lebanon or Palestine or Israel there's no other book that claims to be from God that has come forth in that time frame that would fulfill that prophecy in Isaiah. I'd be happy to send you my notes if you're interested on the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the power of angelic ministry which assisted in bringing it forth. But that book was brought forth by the power of heaven for the convincing of Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God manifesting himself unto all nations, written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Through the power of heaven and Joseph's prophetic ministry, his faith, faithful prophetic ministry, the church of Jesus Christ was restored that the gospel of Jesus Christ might be pro proclaimed in its fullness unto the ends of the world. Authority to represent him was restored to the earth. John the Baptist, it is the testimony of Joseph and Oliver, was the one who, in angelic form, ordained them to that same office in the Aaronic priesthood that he held. What a marvelous testimony. The true doctrine of Christ's church was restored. The mission to evangelize the world to restore Israel to her covenants, to assist in the redemption of the holy city, even Zion. Those divinely appointed tasks were restored. No other church carries such a commission. I want to share with you, uh, I'm going to be about just a, a few more minutes. I hope you can, um, I hope the roast isn't burning. I want to share with you just a brief portion of the testimony of Joseph and Sidney. On February 16th of 1832, by the power of the Spirit, their eyes were opened and their understandings were enlightened so as to see and understand the things of God.
Now this caused us to marvel, for it was given unto us of the Spirit. And while we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understandings, and they were opened. And the glory of the Lord shone round about, and we beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father, and received of his fullness, and saw the holy angels, and they who are sanctified before his throne, worshiping God and the Lamb, who worship him forever and ever. And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him. That he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God. And we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. What other church on the face of the earth has that testimony as part of its foundational message? In just 12 years from that time, Joseph would seal his testimony of the Lord Jesus and the divinity of his work. The work to which he had been called with his own blood. And I love uh, the words of Lucy, his mother. Joseph and Hiram, her two sons, had been killed in Carthage and their bodies returned to Nauvoo. And they were dressed and in the parlor. The, the bodies had been cleaned up, but they were lying in state, if you will, in the parlor. And you can imagine the grief of the families. The sons and the daughters. The wives. The mothers and fathers. And Lucy heard these words of comfort. As I looked upon their peaceful, smiling countenances, I seemed almost lost to hear, I seemed almost to hear them say, Mother, weep not for us. We have overcome the world by love. We carried to them the gospel that their souls might be saved. They slew us for our testimony and thus placed us beyond their power. Their ascendancy is but for a moment. Ours is an eternal triumph. Words that I'm sure comforted the heart of a grief-stricken mother. It is by faith that men pursue that city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11 says that these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Joseph joined all the prophets who had gone before him. His faith and vision was the same as Abraham's and Isaac's and Jacob's, the same as all who had been called to bear the mantle of prophetic leadership in their time. Joseph Smith, Jr. sealed his testimony with his blood. And because of that, it is worthy of our investigation. It is worthy of our inquiry as to the truth of his testimony. May this series of sermons set you on a journey of discovery. That through the exercise of your faith, even if, if it be no more than a grain of mustard seed, you might come to a knowledge of the fullness of truth, having it confirmed unto you by the Holy Ghost, the divinity of those things which have been, have been and will yet be shared. I can assure you that if you seek that truth with the sincerity of your heart, the loving and almighty God who created you and desires your eternal companionship will not withhold it from you. My testimony to you this morning is that the message of the restored gospel is true and worthy of the exercise of your faith in pursuit of your own testimony of its divine origin. We must trust that God is presiding over our lives and within the boundaries of our agency, 
to choose is doing all that he can to move us toward an understanding of truth that will carry us into his presence. We must believe that. We must have the faith that he is doing that. He is about to pour out his judgments upon the wicked. So then we must move out in the greatest expression of our faith to meet the challenges of this hour. Just as Noah's ark was a place of refuge for the righteous in his day, so is the kingdom of God on earth, even Zion, a refuge for the righteous. And the latter-day ark in our day. And it is extended unto those who desire citizenship and qualify themselves for it in that holy city. May God richly bless us as we move forward from this place in faith with that hope eternal. That the God of heaven is presiding over our lives and over his work and that he will be victorious, even light over darkness. Join me in prayer. O oh God, our eternal Heavenly Father, you have blessed us mightily this day. And as I pronounce the benediction on this service, it is with your blessing, Father. For you have blessed each one who has gathered to worship you here and your servant who delivered the message in this hour, praying that our hearts and our minds will be quickened, that we'll be able to retain the gift from on high that you've given us this day, thanking you in the name of your Son, Jesus, your only begotten Son, amen.